This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and it's time for another MTG Top 10, the series where I usually rank cards based on their historical performance at Magic's highest level of competition. However, sometimes I like to do lists that look at the most expensive cards in the game, and that's what we're doing today with a look at Magic's most expensive creatures. In this list, I'll talk about these expensive cards and explain why exactly they are so expensive. Generally, a card ends up with a high price if it is exceptionally rare, and or if it's heavily played in 60 card formats, and or if it's heavily played in Commander. A few things to keep in mind about how I compile this type of list. First, a set can only appear on the list once. So if there's a set that would have multiple cards appear on this list, I simply take a look at the three most expensive cards from that set. This type of list is already going to be skewed towards much older sets, and this prevents that from being quite as pronounced. Additionally, I only count the regular version of a card. In other words, no promotional or foil versions of cards are considered. The prices in this video are the price for that card and its original printing. Lastly, the prices are Card Kingdom near mint prices, and as usual, if you want to own any of these cards, you can find links for each of them in the description. All right, let's take a look at Magic's most expensive creatures, starting with number 10, which is... Phyrexian Dreadnought, which costs about $95. This one mana artifact creature is a 12-12 with Trample, but obviously it comes with a downside, and it's a big one. When it comes into play, you have to sacrifice any number of creatures with total power 12 or more, or you sacrifice the Dreadnought. In other words, it's pretty challenging to actually play this monster in the early game because that's a pretty serious requirement. However, the card can be abused. Over the years, it's been played in legacy decks that could stifle the Dreadnoughts into the battlefield trigger. These days, it doesn't see play in any official 60 card formats, but it is played in pre-modern, a popular fan format that uses cards from 4th edition through Onslaught block, and decks in that format also look to use Stifle with the Dreadnought. There isn't incredible demand for the Dreadnought in Commander, but if you have a deck that likes sacrificing things, the Dreadnought is pretty good at helping you do it. The Dreadnought is also a fairly iconic card. Many players from the era remember seeing this card for the first time in a booster pack, and it was unlike any other card that ever came before it. I mean, it's a one mana 12-12 with Trample. So there are nostalgic collectors that are also interested in having this card. The biggest factor in the high price tag, though, the Dreadnought is on the reserved list. That means it is on a special list of cards that Wizards of the Coast has promised never to reprint, so the only way to get the Dreadnought is this original Mirage printing, and there just aren't that many of them out there. At number 9, it is Edgar Markov, which costs about $110. For 3 generic, a red, a white, and a black, Edgar is a 4-4 with first strike and haste, and whenever he attacks, you put a plus and plus one counter on each vampire you control. He also has Eminence, which means that he gives you an effect whether he's in the command zone or on the battlefield, and in this case you get a 1-1 vampire token. Eminence is incredibly powerful, as it allows you to effectively start the game with an emblem, and this one is no joke, as it will make all of your vampires way better. It isn't very challenging to go really wide before Edgar ever sees the battlefield, and then, once he does, he's going to buff your entire board. Because Edgar is from a commander set, the only 60 card formats he's legal in are Legacy and Vintage, and it doesn't see play in either format. After all, those formats don't have a command zone, so you don't get the same value out of Edgar as you can in Commander, where he is in incredibly high demand. He's the commander in over 16,000 decks on EDA Trek, which makes him the 8th most popular commander in the entire game. That combined with the fact that Commander 2017 is the only time this card was ever printed means that the demand for this card is outstripping its supply. At number 8, it's Metalworker, which costs about $120. For 3 generic, Metalworker is a 1-2 artifact creature, and you can tap it and reveal any number of artifact cards in your hand. When you do, you add 2 colorless for each card you reveal that way. In other words, if your deck is jam-packed with artifacts, Metalworker produces obscene amounts of mana, and because you have a bunch of artifacts in your hand, well, you're also going to have things to spend that mana on. Over the years, it has powered artifact decks in Standard, Extended, Legacy, and Vintage. It would have done even more in Extended and Legacy, but it got permanently banned in Extended and was banned in Legacy between 2004 and 2009. It's had the largest impact on Vintage, a format where it is one of the key cards in Mud decks, which specialize in playing a bunch of artifacts and ramping a ton of colorless mana to power out massive threats. There are a couple of different origin stories about the deck's name. One is that it's called Mud because of the brown borders on old artifacts, and the other is that it stands for Metalworker Ultimate Domination. I can find older sources going with the Metalworker name, but it is hard to tell which came first. In the end, the name seems to reference both Metalworker and the frames. 
Regardless, the worker does a great job of making boatloads of mana for artifact decks in 60 card formats. There's also significant demand in Commander where it sees play in over 14,000 decks, and you can bet that number would be a lot higher than that if this card weren't so challenging to get your hands on, as it would be an auto-include in any artifact deck. So you take that high demand for 60 card formats and Commander and combine it with the fact that the worker is on the reserve list, and we're talking about a card that there simply aren't enough copies of in order to meet the demand. At number 7, I've got the two most expensive creatures from Antiquities, Argivian Archaeologist, which costs about $200, and Triskelion, which costs about $130. For one generic and two white, the Archaeologist is a 1-1 that comes with an activated ability. You can pay two white and tap it to return an artifact from your graveyard to your hand. The Archaeologist has never seen play in Magic 60 card formats, and it isn't in very high demand in Commander either. In other words, this is a case where the card's scarcity is the entire reason it's so expensive. Antiquities is only Magic's second ever expansion, and this is on the reserve list. So, even though the card isn't played by pretty much anybody, there is enough demand for the card, just among collectors, to keep the price so high. Triskelion costs 6 generic mana for an artifact creature, and it enters the battlefield with 3 plus and plus 1 counters. You can remove a plus and plus 1 counter from it to have it do 1 damage to any target. Unlike the Archaeologist, Triskelion is a card that people actually play. While a 6-mana 3-3 isn't great, being able to ping stuff by removing counters is pretty sweet, especially if you have ways to put more counters on it. This makes Triskelion quite flexible, as it can function as a creature, or a removal spell, or even a way to finish off your opponent. This has led to it being a pretty popular toolbox creature over the years, and sometimes it can also enable some combos. In Extended, it was played as a singleton toolbox creature at first in Tinker decks, and later in Tron decks. In Legacy, it's been played in Survival of the Fittest decks, including a variant with a combo kill that involves putting Triskelion and Phyrexian Devourer into the graveyard with a Necrotic Ooze in play. If you did this, the Ooze would have their combined activated abilities, which means you could exile a card from the top of your library to put counters on Triskelion, and then remove all those counters to kill your opponent. It's been played the most in Vintage, though, where it's been primarily played in Mud decks. You can see how Metalworker and other Artifact Ramp would make it really easy to get this into play early. It's also played a lot in Commander, where it often appears in plus one plus one counter-centric decks. You might be wondering why Triskelion is so much cheaper than the Archaeologist when there is more significant demand for this card, and the answer to that is simple. It isn't on the reserve list. It's been printed several times, including in Mirrodin and in Magic 2011, and if you want to obtain this card on the cheap, you can, but its original printing is rare enough that the price is still pretty high. At number 6, it is Gilded Drake, which costs about $230. For one generic into blue, the Drake is a 3-3 flyer, and when it enters the battlefield, you exchange control of it and up to one target creature and opponent controls. It gets sacrificed if you don't make an exchange. That effect is pretty strange, and it isn't something you want in every format, but it is an effect that you want in Legacy, a format with lots of decks that cheat huge creatures into play. It works especially well against Show and Tell, because your opponent can put their Gristle Brand into play while you put your Drake into play, and obviously you're going to come out ahead there. The Drake is also heavily played in Commander, a format where lots of people cheat huge creatures into play. One of the spiciest things you can do with it is use it to steal an opposing Commander. Gilded Drake is also on the reserve list, of course, and it's in high demand for both Legacy and Commander players, resulting in this high price tag. At number 5, I've got the three most expensive creatures from Legends. Angus McKenzie, which costs $280, Gwendolyn de Courcy, which costs $200, and Hazazon Tamar, which costs $160. Legends was the first set to feature both multicolored and legendary cards, and obviously all three of these are both of those things. Many of the multicolored legends in Legends are famously bad, but these three are actually pretty good, or at least they aren't terrible. Angus McKenzie costs a green, a white, and a blue, and he's a 2-2 that can fog the board if you pay a green, a white, and a blue and tap him. Having the ability to fog every single turn is likely to drive your opponents crazy. Gwendolyn costs one blue, two black, and a red, and she's a 3-5 that can tap to make a player discard a card at random, though you can only use it at sorcery speed. That is a pretty nice disruptive effect, though. Hazazon Tamar costs 4 generic, a red, a green, and a white, and he's a 2-4. When he enters the battlefield, he makes X 1-1 one, one tokens during your next upkeep, where X is the number of lands you control. In other words, he can make you go insanely wide, and if you find a way to get rid of Hazazon before your next upkeep, you get to keep all those tokens, too. While none of these have ever seen play in 60-card formats, there is some demand for them in Commander, with Angus and Hazazon being fairly popular. But the biggest factor here is that all three of these are on the reserved list. 
At number four, it's Sliver Queen, who costs about $300. For one mana of each color, she's a 7-7, and you could pay two generic mana to make a 1-1 Sliver Creature token. She's an iconic card, as Slivers are one of the most popular creature types around, and she's the first legendary one we ever saw, and she happens to be absolutely massive and incredibly powerful. She never saw much play in 60 card formats, but she is in pretty high demand for a commander, especially for a 5 color card that is so challenging to get your hands on. While she isn't the most popular sliver commander these days, she is played in pretty much every sliver commander deck, provided the deck's owner can afford the sliver queen's $300 price tag. Like most of the cards on this list, she's also on the reserve list. At number 3, I have the three most expensive creatures from Portal 3 Kingdoms, the $500 Zodiac Dragon, the $250 Jahu Dune, the One-Eyed, and the $160 Dong Zhu, the Tyrant. Before we talk about these cards individually, it's important to discuss the set these cards are from. Portal 3 Kingdoms is just an incredibly rare set. It was created as a game for Asian markets that could stand on its own while also being a beginner version of Magic, and it wasn't even released in North America. It was based on the Three Kingdoms period in Chinese history, with many cards actually representing real historical figures, including both of these legendary creatures. That rarity makes cards from this set quite costly, even though most of them aren't played a whole lot in any format, and that's certainly true of these three. It is notable, though, that none of these cards are on the reserve list. Zodiac Dragon costs 7 generic and 2 red. It's an 8-8, and when it is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, you get to return it to your hand. Obviously, that's not super efficient, and returning this to your hand doesn't exactly feel impressive as a result, but there is one area where it can be interesting, when you combine it with effects like Sneak Attack, that put a creature into play and give it haste until end of turn before sacrificing it at the end of your turn. Playing this as a 1-mana 8-8 with haste every turn is pretty sweet. Jahu Dune is a 3-2 that costs 2 generic and 2 black, and he's a 3-2 with horsemanship. Horsemanship was Portal 3 Kingdom's version of flying. In other words, a creature with horsemanship can only be blocked by another creature with it. You can also sacrifice Jahu Dune to return a black card from your graveyard to your hand, but you can only activate the ability during your turn and only before attackers are declared. Of these three cards, it's by far the most heavily played in Commander, as it actually has passable evasive stats and an ability that can be abused fairly effectively by most black decks. Dong Zhu the Tyrant costs 4 generic and a red, and he's a 3-3 that forces a creature your opponent controls to do damage equal to its power to that player. Obviously that effect is kind of hard to abuse, but it is fairly unique, and it's fun to imagine blinking Dong Zhu to do a ton of damage to your opponent. At number two, I have the three most expensive creatures from Arabian Nights, which was Magic's very first expansion, making it the rarest set out there this side of Alpha. These are Juzum Jin, which costs about $2,100, Serendib Ifrit, which costs $550, and Ernam Jin, which costs about $300. All three of these have a similar design, as they have above rate stats and a downside, and back when these were printed, these stats were even more impressive than they are today. The Jin is the most expensive of the three, because it's also the only one on the reserved list. For two generic and two black, it's a 5-5 that does one damage to you during your upkeep. In its heyday, it was one of Magic's most powerful creatures, though it doesn't see play in 60-card formats today, nor is it in especially high demand in Commander. However, he is one of the most iconic Magic cards ever, especially among players of a certain age, and as a result, there are a lot of nostalgic collectors out there who want to get their hands on the Jin, and that's hard thanks to its presence on the reserve list. After all, every single Juzum Jin that will ever exist was printed way back in 1993. Serenda be free costs 2 generic and a blue, and it's a 3-4 with flying that does 1 damage to you at the beginning of your upkeep. Like the Djinn, it saw play in aggro decks in Magic's early days, but doesn't see a whole lot of play anywhere today. Lastly, there's Air Nam Jin. Of these three, it has the most extensive history at Magic's highest level of competition. For three generic and a green, it's a 4-5, and at the beginning of your upkeep, it gives target non-wall creature and opponent controls Forest Walk. While that can certainly be a significant downside, there were lots of things you could do to make it irrelevant. The most successful decks featuring the Jin combined it with Armageddon. The two went together so well that there was a deck called Ernam Geddon, which was an aggro deck that sought to stick a few creatures and then cast Armageddon while you're ahead on board, at which point you would take over the game. You could also simply not play any forests or sacrifice them to your Zuron orbs so your opponent's creatures 
wouldn't be unblockable. So it was a four mana four five with little or no downside in the decks that played it. And in the early days of competitive magic, it was one of the best creatures around, even capable of attacking through the feared Sarah Angel. Air Nam Jin was a fixture at standard and extended competitive events between 1994 and 1998, though it hasn't really been relevant anywhere since then. And at number one, probably not surprising anyone, it is the three most expensive creatures from Alpha. The $9,300 Sheevan Dragon, the $5,800 Birds of Paradise, and the $5,500 Vesuvan Doppelganger. Affle is, of course, Magic's original printing of its very first set, and they are the rarest cards in the game. All three of these were rares, too, so they're the rarest of the rare. That said, neither Sheevan Dragon nor Birds of Paradise is on the reserve list, so they can be obtained for a lot less than these incredibly high price tags, but they are still the most expensive creatures in Alpha. Sheevan Dragon costs 4 generic and 2 red, and it's a 5-5 flyer with fire breathing. By today's standards, the dragon isn't that impressive, but in the early days of Magic, it was one of the best creatures in the game, and it saw significant play. Creatures in Alpha are largely just not very good. So Sheevan Dragon was quite the impressive card at the time. In addition to being really rare, there are a lot of nostalgic collectors who want to own this Sheevan Dragon. It's one of the most iconic cards in the game. People remember how excited they were to open and play with this card in 1993 and 1994, and this leads to many people wanting to obtain the rarest version of the card. Birds of Paradise costs one green, and it's a 0-1 flyer that can tap for mana of any color. Of these three, it's the card that is the most relevant in today's 60-card formats in Commander, and it also has the most extensive tournament history. It's simply one of the best mana dorks around, as it lets you easily play out more powerful spells a turn ahead of your opponent. The Doppelganger costs 3 generic and a blue, and it enters the battlefield as a copy of any creature on the battlefield, except it doesn't copy that creature's color, and it has, at the beginning of your upkeep, you may have this creature become a copy of target creature, except it doesn't copy that creature's color, and it has this ability. In other words, it's a clone that doesn't stay locked in on whatever it copies in the first place, meaning it will really always be just as good as the best creature on the battlefield. It's the only one of these three that's on the reserve list, and that plays a huge role in the price tag because it's played a lot less than either Sheevan Dragon or Birds of Paradise. But those two cards are more expensive because they're not only incredibly rare, they're cards that were actually good at one point in Magic's history, and Birds of Paradise is still really good today. So, those are the most expensive creatures in Magic. If you're interested in owning any of these cards, because maybe you have a small fortune, check out the description, where you can find a Direct Card Kingdom link for each card that appeared in the video. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on past videos, including more that look at the most expensive cards in the game, you should see some playlists on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.